Well, my name is Brian Donnelly. I'm the chief exec of Cleveland Clinic London. It's nice to be back uh, at the Medical Innovation Summit. I think we're here for a great 30 minute session and have just a wonderful guest. And I'd like to introduce Mace Rothenberg, who will be joining us. Dr. Rothenberg is the chief medical officer of Pfizer. Dr. Rothenberg leads Pfizer's worldwide medical and safety organization. He's the former head of clinical development and medical affairs for oncology at Pfizer and the previous chief development officer for oncology. During that time, he was responsible for the successful development and approval of 11 new cancer medications. Dr. Rothenberg is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. He received his undergraduate education at the University of Pennsylvania and his MD from New York University School of Medicine. Dr. Rothenberg did his postgraduate training in internal medicine at Vanderbilt in medical oncology at the National Cancer Institute. And he's previously on faculty at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio and previous faculty at Vanderbilt University. Mace, welcome to the Medical Innovation Summit and thank you so much for spending time with us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, although I'm joining you virtually, it does feel uh, good to be back in Cleveland. Um, just a year ago, I was uh, in Cleveland, um, not as a speaker, um, but actually as a patient. Um, I uh, had uh, heart surgery there and thank goodness uh, it was successful. I'm back to a full and active lifestyle. So I can actually say that, um, that uh, Cleveland Clinic holds a very special place in my heart, both literally and figuratively. So thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mace. I'm glad to see that you're doing uh, so well. You. Mace, you start, when, when I go through your introduction and I see the tremendous number of experiences uh, that you've had, I think it'd be interesting to start by hearing about your career path and about your responsibilities in your present role at Pfizer. Well, thank, thanks, Brian. Um, you know, sometimes um, you plan things out carefully. Um, and sometimes you just realize that there are wonderful opportunities that are in front of you and it's, it's yours to take. And, and I think my experience was more in the latter. I, I, after I finished my residency training at Vanderbilt, I had an opportunity to do my fellowship um, at the National Institutes of Health. So that was my foray into the federal government. Um, I trained there, both my clinical training and uh, laboratory and clinical research training. And then I got my first post uh, um, graduate uh, job there, a special assistant to the director of the Division of Cancer Treatment, Bruce Chavner at that time. And I got a, a, a unique insight into the role that government plays in facilitating the development of new medicines, in this case, cancer medicines, um, and uh, having a broad perspective um, and, and actually having a chance to, to begin to learn about how to be an investigator there as well. Um, then an opportunity uh, came um, at, uh, in Texas, of all places, not, not planned, but uh, something that uh, I was contacted about to actually join what at that time was the largest phase one drug development program in oncology uh, in the world, uh, led by Dan von Hoff, and also to, uh, to have responsibilities working with one of the largest uh, nationwide cooperative clinical trial organizations, the Southwest Oncology Group, and be the executive officer uh, for that. So, uh, so I went there and then had a, an opportunity to, uh, to gain more experience in this early phase one uh, uh, development first in human experience with new promising cancer medicines at a time when we really were at an inflection point for translating science and biology into new medicines. And so that was a great experience. And also at, at SWAG, having a chance to learn how to conduct and oversee and facilitate national clinical trials of new cancer therapies. Um, and, uh, and then uh, had an opportunity to uh, move back to Vanderbilt um, uh, in, in uh, 1998 um, to lead their phase one drug development program. And uh, that's also where I became much more involved in laboratory clinical translational research, um, working with uh, Bob Coffey, uh, who is the principal investigator on our GI SPORE grant, a specialized program of research excellence. And I was the clinical co-PI for that. So I really had a chance to see the power of laboratory insights <laughs> informing clinical development strategies, but also how observations made in the clinic and samples obtained from patients could be tested in the laboratory 
to confirm and gain greater insight into those theories. So that's a chance, that was my, my foray into academia. Uh, and then an opportunity came available to, uh, to move to industry. It wasn't planned, but it was one that I realized would allow me to have a, yet a, a third perspective um, on the whole field of medical, medical innovation and new drug development. So for the first 10 years uh, at Pfizer, I led the uh, clinical development program for oncology uh, medicines. We had some great successes in terms of now bringing to, 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 to bear some of the new advances in um, molecular biology and targeted therapies and identifying patients whose tumors were driven by certain molecular abnormalities and being able to match the right drug to those patients. So we had some wonderful experiences there. And then two years ago, I was asked um, to, uh, to take on a, a broader responsibility for the first time, not working in drug development, but working in medical and safety and overseeing the great organization that we have here at Pfizer, um, which is really the largest medical and safety organization within the industry. Uh, it's uh, more than 2,600 colleagues around the world um, where we're responsible for making sure that we have the most complete and up-to-date and accurate insight into our medicines from medicines that are still in the laboratory and working their way through clinical development all the way through those that are on the market. And even after they've lost patent protection, we're still responsible for those that, we, that were innovated at, at Pfizer to be able to monitor them for, for safety and being able to, to take that responsibility and make sure that that information that we bring in to Vanderbilt, to, I'm sorry, to, to Pfizer is able to be uh, analyzed, characterized, and then communicated externally, both to regulatory agencies like the FDA to make sure that they have up-to-date information on the benefit risk profile for our medicines, and also to people who prescribe and take our medicines, the patients, as well as providers, to make sure that when they're considering using a Pfizer medicine, they make the right decision, whether to use it or not to use it, based on all the available information that we have on those risks and benefits. So it really has been uh, an evolution. It's allowed me to go from early in my career, uh, seeing and, and treating individual patients, to then getting involved in small phase clinical trials where we treated dozens or uh, 50 patients or so, to then hundreds of patients in larger nationwide clinical trials. And now at Pfizer, overseeing um, a portfolio uh, of, of medicines that actually um, are prescribed by hundreds of thousands of healthcare providers to literally hundreds of millions or even billions of patients around the world. So it's uh, given me that perspective as well and how, how we can impact uh, health from an individual to a global basis in what we do. My organization is also responsible for um, funding meritorious external uh, research proposals that come in through our Global Medical Grants Program that address uh, gaps in, in knowledge, research, or practice. We're also responsible for making sure that the results of our clinical trials uh, are published in a timely and accurate manner. So it really is a broad organization and one that I'm really privileged to be leading at Pfizer. Well, it's such a <laughs> Such an interesting story, Mace, uh, as you tell that story. And uh, as I sit and think of the times that we've run this innovation summit over the previous years uh, and being in Cleveland and talking to the different components of innovation, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, actually government regulation, in many ways, you're wrapping all that into one person. Two interesting things I hear that you say, which tell, you know, remind me the story of successful innovation is how you learned every step of the way. It, it, you took it all as a learning opportunity. And the other uh, thing I wrote down was, you said twice, you know, each step wasn't planned. And, and in many ways, that's the story of innovation when you come out uh, with some of these. And when I think of wasn't planned, you know, maybe that leads me to ask you, uh, in your role now, all of a sudden COVID hits, a pandemic, uh, you know, how has that impacted what you're doing uh, at Pfizer and your role? Well, it, it, it really has impacted it in, in, in so many ways as it has so many others. For me, actually, it was a coincidence that I was actually scheduled to, to travel to Wuhan, China in March of this year. And so as, as we were learning about the first cases being reported in Wuhan in December and early January, uh, 
my, my team began to ask, are you sure you're going to go to Wuhan? And I said, well, let's see how things turn out. And as it really escalated, he decided to postpone my, my trip to Wuhan. Um, but, but actually, um, I was going there because there, that is one of our areas for our medical information and our safety and our operations hub. We have several hundred colleagues working in Wuhan and our concern first and foremost was for their safety. So working uh, with local uh, um, authorities, um, we were able to move them uh, out of the office and, and, and really have them working more from home. Um, in some cases, um, they had better access to the internet than others, but we tried to, to help along that front. We also recognized that a, a very large volume of work was, was uh, um, had been designated to Wuhan and we had to make sure that our responsibilities of getting this work done, of bringing in uh, safety uh, uh, reports that, that, that come into us and reporting those to health authorities didn't slip in, in terms of our requirement for the timely reporting of these. So because we, we have a distributed hub system, meaning we have not just one hub that we rely on solely, but actually several hubs uh, for our safety and medical information uh, uh, um, organizations that are located around the world, we're able to shift that workload to those other hubs. And as a result, our compliance with our safety reporting, which means depending on the severity and the kind of safety report, we have to report in a specific period of time to all the different health authorities around the world, that never slipped. It continued to be greater than 99% compliant worldwide, which I think is a real tribute to the, to the colleagues who are in Wuhan working under adverse circumstances, working from home in many cases, but continuing to do what they can until they were allowed back in the offices when it became safe to do so. But also our colleagues elsewhere are able to, to, to flex up in terms of their capacity and fill in for um, the work that was too much for the colleagues in, in Wuhan to do under those circumstances. So it affected me in that way. Certainly there was great concern in terms of um, what, what we can do as a company. Um, and right now, just really focusing on my, my own organization, we could talk later about the company at large, but there are, we have a number of people with medical training who are working within my group and across all parts of Pfizer, uh, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, other health, health care providers that really wanted to step up and do something to, to meet this crisis. And so uh, we were able to uh, work with um, uh, uh, HR and compliance and legal and actually come up with a COVID-19 medical service policy that allowed these individuals to be able to volunteer, um, get the time off from their group and from their manager to be able to help contribute to the frontline uh, um, uh, fight against COVID-19. So I'm very, very proud that the organization was able to do that. Um, we stepped up in terms of medical grants and philanthropic efforts. Um, our medical grants program um, was able to uh, designate $5 million for providing uh, re independent research grant support for investigators who had meritorious proposals. And because of the urgency of this, we were able to, to truncate a process that, act, that in many cases took months between the review of the proposal, um, the decision to fund, and actually getting the, the funding in the hands of the investigators, we were able to shorten that process to just a few weeks. So we, we really were able to step up and meet the urgency of that area, of that need as well. So the, those are some of the ways that it affected just my organization. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to hear, uh, Mace. A couple of interesting things I take away. Uh, one, I will tell you, actually, a year ago, April, about 18 months ago, uh, interesting that I was over in China with some work uh, that we were doing and actually did speak at a healthcare conference in a town that I wasn't familiar with, but it was called Wuhan. Uh, so that's interesting that you were there. I, the thing I take away, uh, Mace, which I guess I'm personally happy to hear, you know, is the benefits of a global organization. Where, where you're in different areas, you can have different information. And as I sit here in London uh, with us building a 184 bed hospital right behind Buckingham Palace, you know, to bring the best at Cleveland Clinic and the best UK healthcare together to form a new model of care, you know, it's nice to see how well that works uh, in your organization and how you learn across uh, different uh, areas. Exactly. Um, 
Hey, so Mace, uh, COVID comes, obviously, uh, the overall organization of Pfizer, you know, puts a lot of effort into different areas in specific impacts around COVID. And I, and I know and I've read some of their good things that you personally and that Pfizer have led around that with a true focus on what's best uh, for patients. I don't know if you could tell us a little bit about that. No, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. You know, when, when you're dealing with a, a company that really has a worldwide footprint involving more than 80,000 colleagues in multiple therapeutic areas and hundreds of therapies and medicines that we make, uh, deliver, delivering literally billions of doses a year to the world, um, it's, it's sometimes difficult for us to rally the organization ar around one uh, issue uh, because there's something different going on different parts of the world and different parts of the organization. But what, what COVID-19 has done has been to actually allow Pfizer to work as one with a singular purpose towards really meeting this challenge. And there are many different facets to how we meet this challenge. One that actually I think hasn't been front of mind for many has been our obligation to make sure that the medicines that we produce or may be the, the leading producer or in some cases the sole producer of this medicine in a particular area, uh, how we maintain that supply. Because it turns out that a number of our, of our medicines are, are absolutely critical in treating patients in the emergency room and in the intensive care unit, many of our sterile injectables, many of our antibiotics. And so one of the first things that, that I was brought into was along with the hospital's business unit and, and, and uh, information immunology group to identify what we considered as the critical medicines that Pfizer makes that would be used in the care of patients with COVID-19. And we had identified 77 COVID critical medicines. And our commitment that was made with manufacturing was to make sure that we did everything within our power to ensure the continued production of those 77 medicines that were so critical in the care of these patients. And what this meant, because there were challenges to supply chain for other producers, and even sometimes logistically in getting these medicines there, we made a commitment to those, and in fact, to scaling up. And in fact, the, uh, we increased the, the, the nine most, uh, uh, I guess, highest prescribed medicines, we increased our production by 400%. Now, one thing that I'm very proud of, and I, and I took a very firm stand about this, was that none of the decisions about which medicines to scale up or even which medicines to consider critical had any input from commercial considerations. We didn't think about total revenues. We didn't think about profit margin. These were the medicines from our best medical judgment were, were absolutely essential for these patients. And our manufacturing colleagues have done just a, a magnificent, a heroic job in making sure that, that those medicines were, were available to those patients who needed those. Um, so, so that was one thing. And the other important thing in order to facilitate that was keeping colleagues safe and recognizing the fact that um, as we realized that this uh, pandemic was going to be affecting um, uh, places beyond just Wuhan, uh, um, having people no longer come into the office and work from home. But the, the, there were colleagues who were considered site critical colleagues whose work couldn't be done re remotely. So for instance, colleagues who were involved in manufacturing and to make sure that those colleagues at Pfizer's 40 worldwide global manufacturing sites were in an environment where their safety could be protected so they could continue to produce and manufacture the medicines that were needed by patients around the world, whether they had COVID or whether they had other medical conditions and not to interrupt their care either. So we, and sometimes in advance of official guidance being uh, finalized by uh, um, CDC or WHO to make sure that our colleagues in these sites had personal protective equipment, that there was social distancing, that there was contact tracing, that there was masking for all individuals. These things were put in place. And as a result, we've seen a very, very low incidence of COVID-19 in colleagues who were uh, in our manufacturing facilities. And then recognizing the, the mul multiple facets of COVID not on, on other parts of the organization as well, led to the creation of a COVID-19 global task force that I serve on 
Now it's grown to more than 40 other individuals from all parts of the organization, from the commercial, regional, legal, HR, um, uh, R&D, regulatory, um, really all, the entire organization, because there are a number of decisions that we have to make about um, uh, how our colleagues are going to be able to be kept safe, but yet continue to do their job that go beyond manufacturing. So in terms of our medical affairs colleagues who go and visit with physicians to make sure that their questions are answered and they have accurate information, they were no longer able to go into physicians' offices or hospitals. Um, and so how do we support what they're doing virtually? Same thing with, with our, our sales force. What about our guidance for meetings, meetings that would be held within Pfizer or meetings that were going to be outside of Pfizer? How are we going to position ourselves with national and international meetings where some of our research or some updates were gonna be provided? What kind of guidance uh, can we put in place? And basically we said that there would be no travel, there would be no in-person uh, representation at these meetings. And I think that that was something that um, others followed because they realized this was a, a not a good idea in a time of uh, a COVID pandemic. So there were just uh, so many things that um, when we had actually twice weekly meetings to start with this task wow. force to make sure that we were up to date and, and, and aware of questions and being able to get multiple input into how we would solve those and how we would create guidance for our 80,000 colleagues so they understood what was allowed, what was required of them mm -hmm. and why, and that this was constantly updated and changed based on the circumstances. So I really must say that um, the, the company has, has rallied around this and it really comes from the very top from our CEO, Albert Borla, and that same attitude is, has been filtered down throughout the entire organization about how our, our, our responsibility is uh, to the patients we serve and to the people at Pfizer who, who make this all possible. It's so refreshing to hear, Mace, you know, at the Cleveland Clinic, we constantly talk about our responsibilities to our patients, to our fellow caregivers, to our community and to the organization. And it's certainly, you know, what you say resonates uh, very much with me. Uh, I have about 30 follow-up questions on that because it's so interesting. However, I feel we must move on. Uh, and clearly one thing that I think we're gonna wanna hear about is an update on the COVID-19 vaccine work uh, that Pfizer's done. And this being an innovation summit, uh, in addition to an update, it'd probably be really interesting also to hear how that's been able to be accelerated, because I think in the past, you've been quoted to say that can take up to 10 years time. So I think it'd be interesting for us to hear what you've done to accelerate it, but clearly in your role, prioritizing safety. Absolutely. So we had a pre-existing relationship with a, a German biotechnology firm called BioNTech and that was in the vaccine space. And the collaboration was really to use a new platform, mRNA, um, within a lipid nanoparticle to be able to create what would be a, a pan flu vaccine. So th there was already that the relationship that was established. And then as we began to realize what SARS-CoV-2 meant for us, um, and the fact that it was a virus and that the, the, the sequence was readily available soon after it was identified. Um, through a collaboration with, with BioNTech, we're able to pivot that within a matter of a week or two to focus on generating an mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. And it's just been remarkable um, to be involved in those discussions. You know, it's being led by the vaccines group and Catherine Jansen leads that organization at Pfizer. And, but, but just to see how they were able to design a trial, unlike any other trial that I've ever seen, it was a combined phase one, two, and three trial. Usually those are separate trials. You stop one trial when you finish, you analyze it, you design the next one, and several months, many months later, you start the second phase, same thing to the third phase. Um, that that, that um, didn't happen. And in fact, it really was because of the urgency of moving quickly and through feedback we got from uh, in real time from the FDA, who was much more flexible in uh, allowing us to design these kinds of innovative trials because the need was so great and it was so urgent. And to make th things even more complicated was that we had more than one candidate vaccine because of the technology being so flexible, uh, 
what, what the vaccine was targeted against, what part of the virus, uh, as well as the platform itself. We had four different versions of that. So we had uh, one single phase one, two, three trial with four different candidates going into this funnel and then having to make decisions based on what we were seeing um, that would have to be other than simply protecting against the, the infection because that would take too long and too many patients. So we really based our decisions on the safety profile as well as the uh, effect it had on the immune system through a very sophisticated analysis, not just of antibodies, but the neutralizing antibodies, the kind of memory cells and CD4 and CD8 cells that were produced and really making those decisions in real time and then having manufacturing able to pivot and focus very quickly on the one that had what we considered the best benefit to risk profile. And uh, just to give you an idea, the very first patients were entered into this phase one trial in May of this year. The phase, the phase 2B3 randomized trial began in July of this year and we now have more than 32,000 patients enrolled in September of this year. So it's moved very quickly. But at the same time, we haven't done so by, by sacrificing quality um, or safety. Uh, these individuals are being monitored very carefully. In fact, uh, my wife is a volunteer in this blind study. I don't know if she's gotten the vaccine or the placebo, but I can tell you from firsthand experience how closely these patients are monitored but also the uh, very uh, um, close oversight that we have from an external independent data safety and monitoring committee to make sure that on a weekly basis, they review all updated signals to make sure that if there is an imbalance, we're aware of it, we can characterize it and we can make any adjustments that are needed in terms of the follow-up or the conduct of the study to maintain patient safety. But really balancing that rigor and safety mm -hmm. with speed is something that we take very seriously because we don't want to come up with a clinical trial result or a vaccine that no one is willing to take or prescribe. That wouldn't help anyone. Yeah, which is interesting to bring that up because clearly there's a concern about how comfortable people are with vaccines to see different uh, polls uh, around what percentage of people will take a vaccine. I hear that, see that here in the UK, I see it uh, in America. So, yeah. you know, when you look at the news, including today, uh, out of the New York Times, uh, also in the Financial Times today, uh, it looks like you know it's critically important of how you in Pfizer and other companies balance all of these different aspects, probably like never before, as far as speed, safety, uh, political aspects, government regulation aspects, and that's what we see in the paper today. Can you maybe talk about you know, when you think of innovation, I'm sh you've had these experiences before. You brought 11 oncological therapeutics to the market, and those same dynamics existed. Probably never a focus like on this one. What are your guiding principles that guide you? Well, I, I think it's, um, it's very reassuring to know that not only Pfizer CEO, but the CEO of nine large pharma companies that are involved in working on various COVID-19 and, and SARS-CoV-2 vaccines have committed publicly to high standards for safety and efficacy and, and oversight to ensure that if we do bring a vaccine forward, uh, what we know about it at that time really has a clearly favorable benefit risk relationship. Now, we're, we're in an unprecedented time in terms of the urgency of this and how much we're going to know from how many patients at various points in time. So we have to be working with not only people within the company, but across the industry and with health agencies like the CDC and FDA to balance the urgency of moving quickly so that if we do have a very strong signal, that's the only way we would stop a trial or, or, or call it for efficacy early is if it had an extreme, extremely positive result. Otherwise we'll go through to the final efficacy analysis. And even then, it will only be move forward if we see a clear positive readout and that the safety is acceptable given the potential benefits. But I think at, at this point, the question is how long will that follow up need, need to be in order to feel like you have characterized the safety adequately? Um, will we know late appearing side effects? When you think about it, if the very first individual received this vaccine in May, right now we have 
five months of, of follow-up in that. That's not as long as we typically have for a vaccine, but yet this is not the first vaccine that Pfizer's developed, nor is it the first mRNA ever tested in individuals. We have some idea about what kinds of side effects we'll see, when we'll see that. And then the question is going to be, is that sufficient for not only for us, but for the FDA, the federal government, and most importantly, patients, not patients, vol normal volunteers and healthy people to be able to say, I think that the benefit does outweigh the potential risks, and I'm willing to take this. So we're, we're gonna have to do that in collaboration with the FDA um, and, and, and federal agencies to make sure that it meets not only their, their criteria, but ours as well, in order to bring this forward to the public. Thank you, thank you, Mace. Mace, we have about 30 seconds. What, what have you learned in these last nine months? You're a successful innovator and you've learned a lot of your career. What, what one thing would you tell this audience as we listen that you've learned in this last nine months you know, that is either something you've known before or something new that you've learned about how to be a successful innovator? Great question. When you have a catalyst or a crisis, there is nothing you can't accomplish when working together with other people who see it the same way as a catalyst or a crisis. You can have organizations do things they never thought they could do, work across boundaries, and work in a more compressed time frame with greater success than you ever could have imagined. Wow, that's a fantastic way to end. Mace, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with us. It was great to hear from you uh, and many great lessons. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Brian. It was my pleasure.